Hello and welcome to the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. Each episode will bring you the latest news from the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, as well as fascinating interviews with entertainment personalities, government leaders, and community advocates. St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, where Scotland meets the City of Angels. Let's get started. Our guest today is Eric Riggler. Eric is a film and television musician that has belted out Celtic sounds featured in Oscar-winning films such as Titanic and Braveheart, Grammy-winning albums from Mariah Carey, Phil Collins, Rod Stewart, and Whitney Houston, and hit television series including Outlander, The Walking Dead, and Amazon's The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, to name a few. And as the most recorded piper in history, Eric continues to set the bar at its highest, both as a piper and as a studio musician. Please join Kimberly Bradford, the president of the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, as she sits down with the very talented Eric Riggler for an insightful interview. Hi, Eric. So, uh, so who first encouraged you to pick up the bagpipes? You know, I heard the bagpipes myself when I was a little, little toddler. I must have been, I think my mom said I was about 18 months old. And she told me I was in her arms and we were watching a parade. And uh, amidst all the floats and marching bands walking down the street, a pipe band, pipes and drums, you know, band uh, wearing kilts and everything. Scottish pipe band came marching on the street and I think that was the first time I heard bagpipes and I was just knocked out. I think Mm -hmm. Uh, from that point forward, I just had that sound in my head and uh, loved it. My um, my parents, once they saw that, they encouraged that Uh, my dad was actually a fan of the bagpipes in a a way. He um, it was a big music lover. And he had uh, a huge vinyl record collection. He was a real audiophile. He had a great stereo, I remember, as a kid. And um, so amidst all his classical vinyl LPs and jazz, big band, swing, opera, he wow. had a few bagpipe records that he just liked. Really? <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so anyway, he would put them on every now and then, and I would... Oh, that's that sound again, you know, and and mm-hmm. so it was uh probably yeah, it was that exposure as a as a little kid. Wow, um, and I do remember uh, uh, vinyl records actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're back. All the kids want them now. Uh, I know, especially if they're DJing and doing scratching yeah. again. Yeah. Um, so clearly, you are passionate about music, and I believe that all great musicians and composers uh, need to be. What drives you specifically, and are you a competitive person? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess looking at being a full-time musician or a career musician or professional musician, however you want to refer to it nowadays in our present day, I should say would be a little different. It would be a little different answer that I would give that than if I was asked that question when I was getting into figuring out if I could be a professional musician 30 odd years ago. Um, I think first and foremost, no matter what era it would be in the past or in the present, you've got to be completely you've got to be massively involved in the idea of the instrument or the type of music that you're into. Yeah. Passionate is the word you've got to be first and foremost into it. The answer in this day and age is if you were looking to be a professional musician to make a lot of money now, Mm -hmm. mm, (laughs) that would be not, that wouldn't be the reason you should get into it. I would say, right. Um, you know, 30 years ago, yeah, you could make money in, you know, various facets of being a professional musician. I think being a, um, being a member of an orchestra, professional orchestra 30 years ago, your salary would have been pretty good compared to the cost of living. Mm, It's not the case now. Um, so you really have to be, you've got to want to do this because, that's the real reason 
you're going to be stuck with, hopefully, you know, you, you may make money, you may make a living, but I think the reason that a lot of us do this and why I would do it is, um, if I wasn't doing this for a living, I'd still be doing what I'm doing and I'd be playing in my kitchen or I'd be playing in my bedroom or whatever, you know, or I'd be playing performances, whatever. I think it's just the passion of, of learning a craft on an instrument trying to get good having that you know having that goal that you want to be technically good musically and expressively mature or, or get to that point um and that you know that it co provides a constant amount of of um of fun and uh contentment for you really i mean that's really what it comes down to i suppose when you want to be really good on your instrument you there's different probably avenues for that competitiveness. Maybe it's internal and you just got to be better than everybody just mm -hmm. for that sake. Um, but in the world that I come from in the, the, the Scottish piping tradition, which is the origins of my bagpiping was obviously, I've been playing the Scottish bagpipe 50 years now. Um, but for the huge part of my early life, um, the bagpipe world in the Scottish bagpipe world, I should say, is based in a comp competitive tradition. The Highland Games, which is a traditional cultural event that most of your podcasters will, and viewers will know what I'm talking about. But for the average person, what is a Highland Games? A Highland Games is a traditional festival that goes way back hundreds of years uh, in Scotland that was sort of um, a competitive day or a, you know, like a, a festival day, but it also had athletic events. It had bagpiping events. It had Highland dancing events. Um, those are the main kind of three things were Highland dancing, piping. In the old days, they probably had fiddling as well, stuff like that, maybe even harp competitions. But in any case, in the modern day, as, as a kid, I grew up playing in competitions. So yes, okay. you're, you're competitive in that sense that you want to beat your peers, you know, um, and in when you're playing in a pipe band in those competitions, there's solo bagpipe competitions and then pipe band competitions, two separate things. Um, many pipers will be involved in both of those fields of competition. But yeah, it's a striving of trying to get as good as you can and 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 hopefully win. Mm hmm. Well, speaking of, of competitions, um, I know you began your career in piping at around seven years old, I think I read. Um, you went on to win the California State Championship uh, in your early teens. Um, you even moved to Scotland to study, and I found that quite interesting, too. So that really shows me that you had a drive and a motivation and a passion for it. You've won the Young Piper of the Year Award, among many other awards. Uh, but during that time, you began composing. Uh, many world champion pipe bands, both Scottish and Irish, have performed your compositions. Uh, what's the most complex piece you've ever written that pipe bands perform? I guess the short answer would be a tune I wrote. Um, gosh, it's been a few years now and it's been played, still being played. It's probably the tune now is almost 30 years old, but it's still being played uh -huh. uh, by pipe bands around the world. Uh, it's called the B-52. Uh -huh. um, and... You know, it. I suppose looking at it in that context of the question, it's complex. It's it's a difficult, technically difficult piece of music. Um, but I never wrote it to be cleverly tricky or or trying to be difficult for the sake of it being difficult, um, like a test piece. It was never ever in my mind. I don't write that way as a composer. I think for me, it just melodies come into my head. And uh, sometimes they can come into my head just without even having an instrument in my hands. I'll just get a melody that'll just, who knows where it comes from. And it'll start just kind of going on autoplay in my brain. And I'll start thinking of other variations and other phrases and other parts to develop it. Sometimes I'll do that for ages before I even pick up my instrument and try it. It's actually 
just kind of going around my head. Um, but other times, you know, I've picked up my instrument and I've just been playing around, noodling around or doing whatever, um, not specifically focused on anything. And, and a melody comes out and then you get a little excited about it. You used to keep playing it and you keep trying to, you know, add to it. But um, yeah, my, my style of composing is, I guess most people uh, in the bagpipe world would say that my compositions are definitely not uh, not the ordinary type. They would have a little bit of, there's something a little out of left field with them. And it's just, like I said, it's nothing that I try to manufacture in that way. They just might, just the way my brain works, it's just that's my strange idea of, of how melodies develop. And they always have a little bit of a twist and it just comes out that way naturally is just what it is, you know? Very so, cool. but yeah, I've been honored, been honored that some of the top bands in the world, world champion bands have played my, my tunes. And every now and then I'll get a text from a friend saying, Hey, here's a link to YouTube. They're playing your tune again in the world pipe band championships or something like that, you know? So wow. it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's neat. I mean, mm -hmm. hopefully they're standing the test of time. Mm hmm well, and what I've noticed about you, you're very modest. Um, you are a legend, of course, in the pipe band world uh, and piping and also now in film and television and soundtracks and as a musician. Um, early on in your career, I know you were drawn to the complexity of the Illin pipes. Um, I've noticed that those seem to be kind of your pipes of choice or preferred pipes. What draws you to the Ellen pipes is my first question. And why is that sound of the Ellen pipes more suitable to some of the films you've done, Titanic, Braveheart, etc.? That's a good question. Um, as you mentioned, I, yeah, I was living in Scotland for a good number of years. I moved there when I was 21. I took time off university because I really wanted to study and compete in the competitions uh, in Scotland. And I, I was uh, invited in as a guest player of a world champion pipe band uh, at that time. That was in the mid 1980s. The whole thing lasted about 10 years of me basically on and off living in Scotland. But in those first year or two that I was living there, um, uh, when I took time off school, um, I just kind of got into a crowd of some really, really top pipers. Uh, in, in This was in Glasgow, in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And um, they were also involved in the folk music of Scotland and Ireland, uh, traditional folk music, which would be different than pipe band music right. and solo piping music. Um, it would be more like, I mean, the broadest example I could give would be something like the Chieftains who, mm -hmm. you know, are a band from Ireland who, mm -hmm. you know, play the traditional instruments of Ireland and play traditional music. But then, you know, they've played with Sting and Rolling Stones and everything, and they've had a very illustrious career. But the, that tradition where they come from is what um, I kind of got exposed to. Now, in the mid 80s, um, you know, there was no Internet. There was vinyl records. There was, I don't even think there was CDs yet. CDs weren't even out yet. So yeah. it was very difficult to hear that kind of folk music that was outside of the bagpipe, like hardcore solo Scottish bagpiping, Scottish pipe band tradition, of which there were LPs. There were vinyl records of that, um, which we all collected as young pipers. You know, we just, we just, if you could ever get your hands on an imported album that came from Scotland, you, you bought it, you know? So, uh, but anyway, when I was, I remember being over at a friend's flat in, uh, in Glasgow and they were putting on some Irish traditional music. Um, and they, they put on a piping record of the Illin pipes of a, a very famous piper um, from the older generation from Ireland. And I was just like, this goes to show like nowadays kids who play Scottish bagpipes, they would know what the Illin pipes are. And of course, in Ireland as well, they would know the Highland bagpipe from Scotland. And right. the cross pollination has all been happening for many years now because of, you know, our communication and Internet and everything that we can find out what other countries are doing and other pipers in other countries. But back then, you know, if you had to get your hands on a record, I heard this Illin piping, this Irish piping. Uh, and I should say the Illin pipes are the traditional bagpipe of Ireland. So that would be unique to Ireland only. 
they do play this what we call the Scottish Highland bagpipes in Ireland, uh, although they call it the war pipes in the Republic of Ireland. They call it the war pipe in the northern part of Northern Ireland. They do call it the bagpipes or the Highland bagpipes or whatever. Um, but anyway, I was just fascinated by the sound of this instrument. I really had never heard before. And I was just like, what is that? And, you know, the, my friends are going, oh, that's a, a piper named Seamus Ennis. And he's a very famous Illin piper. And I didn't even know what the instrument looked like, you know. So that's how that's how foreign it was to the two different cultures, you know, me being in Scotland. And then just across the water is Ireland. But it was like two different universes, really. Right. So I just um, I kind of just made it a point to start collecting recordings of records um, of 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 Ilan Pipers started to listen to a lot of it. And then I think at some point in that one or two year period, I'm like, I want to learn. I want to learn this instrument. Mm -hmm. And there was very few people playing it in America and very few people in Scotland playing the Ilan Pipes. It's primarily strictly to Ireland. So um, yeah, I found, um, finally got a set of pipes, like a practice, like a beginner set. And you know, started learning on my own. And then that process led me to uh, going over to Ireland and spending like four or five summers in a row going to some music festivals there where you could get tuition. You could learn from a good, a really top player, take classes at this sort of a summer school festival kind of a thing. So that's that's how I got going. Um, but the Ilan Pipes um, seem to be, and I was just learning those as I loved them. I wasn't going to there was no competitions. There was nothing. I just wanted to play them and maybe play with some fiddle players or get in a little group or make an ensemble, you know, a folk ensemble. Um, but when I had kind of been coming back to America for a good chunk of the year and then, of course, going back to Scotland, at that point, I started, um, I guess my name got out there um, that this there's a guy playing the Illin Pipes in L.A. And at the time, this would have been sort of like the early 1990s, uh, here in LA mm -hmm. <clears throat> at the time, like there just happened to be sort of something that was happening in our Hollywood industry where Celtic music started to becoming kind of a cool thing. You know, I think right. you know, stuff kind of moves through fashions and fads and mo you know, different kind of like a, a time period where something is cool and then it, they move on, you know, in this industry. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, they just Celtic music became something that was being starting to get embraced by the record industry and then the television and film industry, you know, with, with incorporating some instruments, you know, of Celtic music into soundtracks. And that's kind of where my career started in that field is that I think they wouldn't have been, you know, they would have been hiring me to do the Highland, Scottish Highland bagpipes a little bit, mm -hmm. but so I would have done a few films and things in the beginning um, that were using the Scottish pipes. But all of a sudden I was like, wait, there's a guy here that plays these, the Irish bagpipe, and that's called the Ilan pipe. And it just became this thing where it started to snowball. You know, it's like you do something on some project and some right. producer or some artist tells somebody and then some film director hears about it or some film composer. And though that guy's in L.A. and it just kind of slowly kind of. You know, they no longer had to probably bring fly somebody in from right. Ireland yeah. or New York or Chicago or something like that, you mm -hmm. know. And so it, it just become it became a fashionable thing in a way in the industry to that the industry embraced Celtic music and, and then distilled down into the, the bagpipes. You know, it's like mm -hmm. there's a sound that nobody really knew or heard. Well, I think that sound was perfect for Braveheart and, and your various other uh, projects that you've done. There's just, they're very haunting, you know, um, yeah. they, they really kind of encapsulate the feel of these films. Speaking of films, um, Lord of the Rings, but you have worked on recently the television series of Lord of the Rings, which was so amazing visually as well as sound wise what are you coming back to for the next lord of the rings mm -hmm. that they're doing i am yeah yep yeah. uh yeah that's um a product of a long relationship with a uh, very talented composer young composer here in la his name is bear mccreary uh and i think uh 
most people maybe not are not super familiar with his name, but they absolutely know his shows because he's the composer of Outlander, which I've been part of for seven seasons now. Um, he's also the composer of The Walking Dead, which was a massively huge, hugely popular show. Um, my kids watched The Walking Dead and they loved that. And then when they found out dad was working with the composer of The Walking Dead uh, <laughs> on Outlander, suddenly dad was cool. So right. <laughs> uh, dad wasn't cool. Braveheart, Titanic. Not nah, before, but nah, now but, he is. <laughs> yeah. But so anyway, yeah, I started first working with Bear McCreary. He called me. Um, he was just out of USC. Um, he got his first gig uh, out of USC film and music school, and he landed a TV show, which is really unheard of. I mean, kids today coming out of SC to get a show right out of school. I mean, good luck to them, but that's that's a long shot. Um, right. It's a competitive world, you know, right. not that it wasn't then, but he landed Battlestar Galactica. Um, when did you start the band Bad Haggis? And I've actually seen you perform because, of course, I go to all of the Scottish festivals here um, and I love the sound. Could you could you tell our viewers a little bit about how you started it, as well as the sound, the style that Bad Haggis has? Yeah. Um, so Bad Haggis is many people think is an oxymoron, you know, but, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, how it came about really was when I was learning the Illin pipes. Um, I started to see now the the Scottish bagpipe and the Illin pipes. The layperson would think, "Oh, it's a Scottish bagpipe. It's an Irish bagpipe. It's kind of the same thing." They couldn't be more different. They're completely different instruments, right. different fingering. One the Scottish bagpipes you blow into the Illin pipes, you don't blow them. You pump it with a bellows, which you have on the other side of the the bag is under the left arm bellows are under the right arm you play them sitting down you don't play them standing up you don't wear a kilt that's scottish you play them wearing civilian clothes um they're very quiet they're about the loud as loud as about a like a violin scottish bagpipes are extremely loud you know <laughs> um, so yeah they're completely different um they play in more keys they play in, they have double the range of the Highland bagpipes, so twice as many notes. There was a lot more freedom in a way with more notes playing more keys. They could play with other instruments easier. Um, and then, you know, I started thinking, gosh, you could play these, I mean, in my own brain, I was like, God, these, you could play these as like a, like almost like an Irish saxophone, which mm. isn't a real instrument, but in my head, <laughs> I could yeah. play this like a sax or I could play it like an electric guitar it was all these things I was like thinking possibilities were like endless with this bagpipe. Not that the Highland bagpipe, Scottish Highland bagpipe isn't amazing. It's it's untouchable in its power and its majesty and its beauty. But the Illin pipes are just a little different, you know. So I think when I was learning them and then when I got into the film studio thing, uh, you know, as a studio musician and continuously playing other people's music, you know, you're playing a composer's music or you're going into the studio to record on a pop album or a rock album and you're playing somebody else's song or you're coming up with parts for their song, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I was composing my own music, but I didn't really have a band or an outlet to play my own music, you know? So that's when I was thinking about what, what a band I, I could invent would be like, and it would be something that, because I grew up with rock music and I grew up with jazz and a lot of influences from what, what my dad listened to, um, I was like thinking, well, it's got to have electric guitar and it's got to have a drum kit. It's got to have bass guitar. I wanted to have a lot of energy. So that's how this band started. It was this idea in my head of mixing the traditional ancient instrument I was playing with modern instruments, you know. So that's that was the beginnings of Bad Haggis. And then I just happened to meet just some really creative people who were amazing uh, virtuosos on their instruments, had a lot of vocabulary, musical vocabulary to speak, you know, so to speak, speak, you know, they could play 
in different musical tongues and jazz and in rock and in African and this and in Latin and salsa and things like that. And I'm like, wow, the, you know, so that's, that was the beginning of Bad Haggis, starting it with a, a couple of guys who are tremendous musicians and then adding musicians from there. And then us all writing our own music based on kind of like, maybe based around my instrument, you know, um, based around this Irish bagpipe. But I was also incorporated a Scottish bagpipe into Bad Haggis. So Bad Haggis is basically me on all my instruments, Highland bagpipes, Illin pipes, the Irish whistles, which are like flutes, um, penny whistles and things. And then electric guitar, bass guitar, drums, vocals, um, sometimes Latin percussion. Um, It's a band that kind of really is unique because we're all mainly writing original material. We will take some Irish jigs or some Scottish reels and adapt them into our world. But it's a very energetic, uh, like highly uh, rhythmic uh, outfit that... um, it can kind of go anywhere. I don't know. Some music uh, critic called us kids let loose in a music, musical Disneyland. That's how we <laughs> describe bad haggis. But um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's been, gosh, it's 25 years now we've been going and wow. um, we've traveled, you know, over to Europe several times and all around the U.S. And it's just it's been a lot of fun. We've all been exploring our own like version of what we think um, we we want to do musically, you know, in this in this weird little microcosm. It's like a musical co-op. Everybody brings their own compositions in. Uh-huh. We feed off that and we create something that's kind of the sum is bigger than the parts, if you will. So. Mm. Well, I've enjoyed hearing Bad Haggis many, many times. And so uh, I hope the band never breaks up. That's all I <laughs> have you. to say. Um So you played on various soundtracks with various uh, rock stars, uh, other musicians, Brian Adams, Bette Midler, Barbara Streisand, Keith Urban, Josh Groban, (laughs) Phil Collins. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, Rod Stewart, just to name a few of them. Is there an artist that you'd really love to work with that you haven't worked with as of yet? Hmm. I could, I would say, I mean, right now I would say that, I mean, I just love how the phone can ring and I don't know who it's going to (laughs) be. And it's sometimes the coolest surprise I could never have imagined. Um, So I'm kind of like in that mode now, I've been doing this for so long in a way I've kind of played with people I've never, I could never have imagined playing with or performing on their record or why they would want what I do on the record, but it's been like the most absurd list of the most famous people in the world or on the biggest Oscar winning films. It's like, it's crazy. I kind of just like take a step back and go, this is like the weirdest career that anybody could have ever had. Cause I never tried to make it what it is. And I never tried to steer it in any way. It just unfolded the way it did just, you know, with the planets lining up, however they did. I mean, you got to be a good musician. Otherwise people aren't going to call you. So it's a given, you got to be good at what you do. But um, I would have said like probably, you know, a good few years ago, one of my favorite artists of all time that I would have loved to play with. And it's probably too late now as we're all, he's probably getting on in age, but he's still amazing. Would have been Peter Gabriel. (gasps) Oh yeah. He was um, a, a huge favorite of my favorite of mine when I was younger. And, um, I listened to him for decades, you know, and I think he just kept maturing and getting more and more amazing. He did have bagpipes on one of his recordings that I know of. Really? Uh, back in the uh-huh. eight, early 80s, yeah. I think it was uh-huh. a song called Biko. It was about Stephen Biko, who was a, um, um, and these are the days of the apartheid. And uh, it uh-huh. was a, a South African, um, you know, iconic figure in South Africa. Uh that Gabriel wrote the song about and he was called Biko, B-I-K-O. And he had bagpipes in there. And I'm not really sure why he had bagpipes in there because I don't know about the <laughs> song content, the lyric content having anything to do with Scotland or anything like that. But um, right. anyway, you know, when I first heard that, I was already a fan of Peter Gabriel. I'm like, oh, he's got bagpipes. <laughs> so cool. But I don't, know, I don't know if he ever had them ever again. He may have, but um, yeah, that would have been the guy. 
Uh-huh. You know, well, oh, maybe Sting. Maybe Sting. Oh, that's Sting, another good I think, one. Um, I have huge respect for, and I think he's he's just been a, an artist that's just evolved his career into like the most interesting, you know, shapes and forms that he's taken. So, yeah, mm-hmm. Sting would have been probably the more current one I would have loved to play with. Well, and I, I think back to Peter Gabriel, he's so eclectic that I'm surprised that there were bagpipes on one of his uh, albums, but not surprised, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. and Sting is another amazing one. Um, so what are the various instruments that you play? So as we spoke about in the beginning, I started learning the Scottish bagpipe. Um, they have different names. It's the same instrument. Sometimes it's called, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the Scottish bagpipes, other time the Highland bagpipes, because they're really originally and historically, they're more from the north of Scotland than, in, well, they would have been all over, but it was known as a Highland instrument, a northern instrument. Um, it's also known officially, um, I suppose, as a, uh, as a musicology term, as the Great Highland bagpipe. Mm. But I started on that instrument um, at age seven. And, uh, you know, that was my life until I discovered or, you know, first heard the Illin pipes. So then the Illin pipes, um, and by the way, for people who don't know, Illin in Irish Gaelic means elbow. It's an, oh. it's a Gaelic word or an Irish word. Because you're spelled, going like this, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's hmm. spelled, well, the spelling doesn't help the, the <laughs> lay person pronounce it. It's spelled U I L L. E A N N. It looks like Yulian, but it's spelled, it's pronounced Illin, like I'm chilling mm-hmm. with the Illin. But, uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, that was, um, so that's, that's the Irish traditional bagpipe. That and then the Irish whistles, um, I play them in like the penny whistle register, which people would probably be familiar with. But we have another instrument in that same um family of instruments which is an octave lower and it's a very beautiful sound it's the uh called the low whistle it's just basically an octave lower um you'll hear that a lot in outlander you'll hear it a lot in uh in the um the new lord of the rings the rings of power Mm -hmm. uh probably most famously it would be heard in in titanic in my heart will go on Uh that's the instrument that's in that track which i didn't play that's my my partner in crime that I worked with for many years on, with James Horner, the composer, uh, it was a guy named, it's a guy named Tony Hinnigan who lives in London. He's the one that actually did the low whistle on My Heart Will Go On. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, but, but we both played in the film, Me on the Pipes, Him on the Whistles. Uh, among your many talents, you're also an, an instrumental soloist, career studio musician as well. Um, a lot of people don't know what that means. Can you tell us what it means as well as kind of some of the positives and negatives about that? Yeah. So like I would say the major cities in the world, um, not all of them, but the biggest ones being Los Angeles because the record industry and of course, New York as well, they, the record industry, um, uh, but more so for in, in London, of course, but more so like with the, the three things that go on here in LA, you know, we've got a, we've got Hollywood, right? Film industry, television industry, record industry. Um, and same with London and um, New York. There's a, there's a body of musicians who would be frequently f- called up to perform on any of those mediums, whether it's a TV commercial, this, you know, the music to a TV ad or a film soundtrack or, you know, pop record, rock record, jazz, whatever, anything. Uh, and, and those, those people kind of are collectively known as studio musicians. You know, we, we have a set of skills that are, you know, you have to be, kind of at the top of several skill levels for different disciplines. You got to be able to read music really well. You got to be able to read music that's put in front of you and you've never seen it before. And you got to sometimes read it for the first time as they record you, as they hit the record button, you're like, wow, I just 
just looking at this cold, you know, uh -huh. and you have to be really good technically as a, as a musician, as a performer, technically proficient. You have to be very expressive as well. You can't just be a robot that plays the notes, but doesn't have any, you got to make people feel something, you know? Right. Um, and then you also have to be able to improvise because sometimes there's no music and they go, great. All right. Well, we're just going to play the track down from the top. Just go ahead and play whatever you hear or feel or whatever. And you're like, wow, I've never heard it before, but you don't say that. That's the inner voice going, okay, here we go. <laughs> you know, um, sink or swim, you know, and usually, uh, in, in that industry, you're expected to what we call nail it, nail the performance in one or two, maybe three takes. Wow. <laughs> sometimes, I mean, the best take can be the first take, as they say sometimes, you know, but, uh -huh. you know, it's like you've got to be, um, you got to kind of have nerves of steel because when you're in the recording studio, you, you'll see a red light come on. Usually it's on the wall and that means they're recording. Uh, and that's when some people freeze, you know, I mean, not everybody, some of the best musicians in the world could be the worst studio musicians just because. Really? They're used to being, you know, technically good, uh, proficient. When they walk out on the concert stage, it's on kind of on their time and their cadence and all that. And it's their audience, you know, but guy, when you're in the, when you're in the studio, you know, you got a bunch of faces looking at you through the glass. Then they're on the other side in the control room. And that could be on a film. That could be the film director, the film composer, nine producers, <laughs> none of who are usually musicians and all have high, are highly opinionated. Right. Um, so you got to just kind of deliver the goods right away, you know, so. So you're a well-traveled musician and you've been to many places around the world. Uh, what country were you most surprised with on the reception you received as as a musician or a performer that's in interesting um first quest first response i had i had to back up and say there's probably two different two different types of country one um and they both like i just wouldn't have expected them to think what i do is cool or be so amazed with it. But um, China was my uh -huh. first answer. Uh -huh. um, playing in China, um, I think it's just like they saw this instrument that, I mean, it's just so unusual for them, you know? It's just like what I do is like, could have been from another planet, you know? Um, but then at the same time, they would have known like Titanic, you know? They would have known. They would know that. I mean, they would know them. They would know the music from Titanic. So, I think to them, it's like, oh my goodness, it's that's the instrument, and or that's the guy that did it. You know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, the few I played in China about five times, and like, it's just like it was super cool. Like people were so like appreciative and so like like just their eyes were just so big about what these sounds were that were coming out of my instrument, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, China was a very cool reception. Um, and then probably Latin America. Uh, yeah. I did, I played on a very big album for an artist I never could imagine I would have played for. He's a, he's a super famous legendary salsa singer named Ruben Blades. And he's also a Hollywood actor. And if- right. If I popped a, a photo of him up on the screen, people would go, oh, I saw that guy. I've seen that guy. Right. But even though he's a, um, you know, he's he, he's been seen in, in quite a few Hollywood films, um, big ones. Um, he's a legendary salsa singer and multi Grammy winner since the 70s. Uh, and so Ruben called me out of the blue to play on an album. And I think it was 2002 we recorded it. He was recording um, a salsa album, but with a world music slant to it. So he wanted Celtic and he wanted some other influences on there besides just Latin music or salsa music, which is his world. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I played the Highland bagpipes, the Illin pipes, the whistles on that album. 
And the album ended up winning the Grammy uh, the following year for the best world music album. And he took me on the road for two years and we traveled. uh, I was part of the band. He had a big band, like 10 or 12 musicians. They're all guys from uh, Costa Rica and Latin America, you know, Central America. Um, And I was the only white guy in the band, you know. Um, I was the gringo, you know, like learning (laughs) what salsa music was because that's like these guys were just masters at it. Um, And uh, but, you know, I was doing my part of the album with them and it was really Mm -hmm. cool. And so we traveled extensively through South America, the Caribbean, Central America. And we did a few North American tours in Latin America. They were just like, wow, what is that that this guy is playing, you know? Mm -hmm. And then again, they would be like, oh, it's that Titanic sound or whatever they could like, whatever was familiar, you know, for this kind of music to them, you know, they'd be like connecting the dots between me and something they may have may or may not have heard, but previously, but anyway, so yeah, it's some, it's cool. You know, I think it makes one in this position kind of feel like, like an, like a, like you weren't chosen, but you suddenly become an ambassador in a way going across, you know, countries, uh, going across borders and with no political stuff. It's all just like music and what people feel from what you do. You know, it's just the message is emotion, I suppose. And it's just like, Mm -hmm. it doesn't need a language. It doesn't need a political agenda. It doesn't need, you know, be on one side or that side or any or us or them. It's just like music is speaking this language that people of any country in any part of the world feel in some way or another. So it's kind of cool. You know, it's, it's kind of a special thing. So uh, are there any projects, uh, film or TV, that you really wish you had worked on? You know, any anything that's already out there that you are kind of a big fan of and um, that you really uh, kind of wish that you had been a part of? I think my younger self would have said something and given you an example, <laughs> maybe, but you know, <laughs> no, no, I just feel like I'm really just super, like I said earlier, I'm very honored and proud of the body of work I've been able to be part of. Um, and I think whatever comes in the future is just another bit of icing on the cake, you know, that's really how I kind of look at things now in a way, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, commercially speaking, no, I, I, I guess it just like, I'm really, I'm blown away that I've been involved in some of these things because I would have never guessed it in a million years that, you know, my instruments would be part of something. So, you know, either huge or not even that something that just didn't seem like how does my thing fit into that? You know, but you, you know, how, however I did it or however it was made to work, it worked. And, you know, I've been lucky in that respect. Um, so no, I mean, it's just really kind of personal projects now that, um, are more of where my ambition or my like excitement and my enthusiasm lies, you know, and I have a new project that, um, that you did come to see and, uh, it's called, you it's called Eric Riggler's Celtic Hollywood, and it's um, mm-hmm. it's um, be- basically a retrospective of my musical life in a way. It's the f- some excerpts, some highlights of some of the film, television, and album recordings that I've been part of, and and then also continually adding to because there's new stuff I'm doing, and we just you know just just did Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, and brought something into that, you know, from that into this project. And even though this project is still new, um, yeah, I'm able to kind of like, it's kind of, it's kind of an interesting thing where it's my life is still going and evolving. And so I can bring in current things as well as kind of like some of the greatest moments I've been able to, or maybe the audience have been able to like hear in films like, you know, Braveheart, Titanic, and, um, you know, um, albums like uh like tubular bells by mike oldfield or 
other television shows, you know, that I've done uh, where we're doing uh, excerpts from Outlander, you know, Lord of the Rings and all that. Um, so, yeah, this is it's a new project and it's um, uh, it's sort of <clears throat> a small ensemble that is kind of modular. We can do it with a larger ensemble, like an orchestra as well. But the um, but it's kind of like a it's like a Celtic chamber group in a way. It's got me playing mm -hmm. my Celtic instruments, and then we've got Irish fiddle um, and uh, harp, which also is very Scottish and Irish in its origins. Well, not in its origins, but it's in its uh, Celtic tradition. You know, that's a big part of those countries. Uh, but then we've got like cello and and piano and piano, you know yeah. um, string section and all that. So it's um yeah, we're able to kind of kind of respectfully cover some of these things that I've recorded in the past and make a kind of really unique and beautiful sort of Celtified um, uh, treatment of whatever this film or TV thing that I'm, you know, that we're doing in the, in the show and we can kind of present it in a kind of a unique way, but completely, um, completely nodding to the way that everyone has heard those pieces, you know, on the screen, you know, it's that definitely, that's the piece you know mm -hmm. <laughs> they know it so yeah it's it's um it that's the that's the immediate future right now for me in answer to both of those parts of the question yeah so the celtic hollywood project i mean we it's barely it we've just getting it off the ground right now um as we speak i'm you know there's a website being built and you know we have live videos from from some of our performances um that we haven't like Basically, the project has not been unleashed and hasn't been unleashed onto the world yet. I've been waiting. You know, we do have a tour booked uh, for Taiwan next year, uh, and it looks like some other countries um, are in the works as well. So um, but uh, yeah, shortly the world will see this pop out on YouTube and uh, social media and all that. The performances we've done up to this point have just been, I've been really kind of keeping them um, under the radar because we're still trying things. It's a new band, it's a new ensemble, mm -hmm. it's a new project, you know? And so I've been trying to like work it um, out sort of, uh, the laboratory has been just a couple of discrete performances on stage. And the one you saw was one of them um, before we kind of, you know, jump out of the cake, so to speak, you know. Um, so that's that. And then, uh, well, yet the next thing um, will be Lord of the Rings of uh, um, season two. But um, yeah, there is a film. I don't know if I can talk about it, but there is a pretty big film that I think I'm recording on in the next month or so uh, that um, will be um, I probably can't even say the composer, but it's definitely a composer that um, <laughs> I've worked with before mm -hmm. and it's a feature film. Oh, uh, so that, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I think that's as far as I should probably go in case I get okay. like a, like a not very nice phone call or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm might... supposed to talk about that. Right. I think uh, I can kind of guess which one of maybe five <laughs> composers like big names that you've worked with them um, that uh but that doesn't narrow it down very much so <laughs> <laughs> no it's yeah it's so i i, I don't i know nothing about it yet so it's going to be news okay. to me when it all kind of boils you know over and i kind of get to see what i'm going to do um but other than that i mean this the most current stuff would be people can hear it's i don't know if it's still in the theaters, but Dungeons and Dragons uh -huh. uh, just it came is. out at the end of March. Um, and that was, um, uh, yeah, I actually, I did not listen to, I haven't seen the film yet. Uh -huh. And my, um, I, I just haven't like even listened to the music until yet, uh, just a couple of days ago. I like went into Apple Music. I'm like, I, I wonder what that soundtrack sound. I haven't even listened to it yet. So I put on, <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons and I was mildly surprised because I never know where you know you can end up on the cutting room floor like you know maybe the producers didn't like what you did and it ends up not being in the movie that happens all the time especially for what I do because the sound of my instruments is even though sometimes I'm playing them in a sort of a chameleon like way where it the the television show or the film or the record has nothing to do with Ireland, Scotland or Celtic or anything. I got to make my strange instrument fit into something. It really doesn't 
really fit in, you know, that's why, you know, and I made a reference earlier, I, sometimes I think like a guitar player, like an electric guitarist on my, on my instrument, or I'll think like a saxophone player, because I got to play this instrument, not like a bagpipe, but I got to play it so that it like fits into maybe whatever shape or form it needs to be for that specific medium I'm playing in, you know, so, um, but anyway, I was listening to uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and man, the first thing you hear on the whole soundtrack, track one, there I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's first great. First thing you hear the, is like a guitar, and then immediately after two bars of guitar, you hear the whistle come in, and then the pipes come in, and then <laughs> you hear it throughout. So yeah, it's kind of cool, you know. It's um, mm -hmm. it's nice to hear that I'm still relevant, um, you, know, <laughs> you know, on the on the big screen as well. So yeah. Uh huh. Very cool. Wow. Thank you so much, Eric, for, wow, you gave us, I think, more time than, than we anticipated, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kimberly. I'm okay. honored that you asked me, and uh, it was a lot of fun and great questions, really, like, really Thank interesting you. ones for me to kind of go, wow, that's... Yeah, I have something maybe cool to say about that, you know, so thank you. It's really, really, it was nice. My yeah. pleasure. It's our pleasure. So thank you again and have a great okay. night with your family, okay? Thanks. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Take bye -bye. care. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. For more information on the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, visit www standrewsla.org. And don't forget to like our Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube channels as well. Have a great week and we'll see you next episode.